Hey guys, it's Dr. Childs here. Today I'm going to be doing uh, some more questions here and um, uh, a Q&A and the questions are going to be coming from this blog post called The Complete Guide to Using Nature Throid Dosing Plus Weight Loss and More. So this has some 381 comments. Um, obviously we won't be able to get through all those but um, I want to go through some of these and we'll just um, get started from the beginning and I'll just kind of give you my thoughts. I'll try and do these questions a little bit um, quicker than I have in the past so we can get through more of them. I think that'll be a little bit better. So um, first question is by Amy. She says, referring to Nature Throid, will it help with hair growth? Um, and the, I guess the answer to that is it depends. So thyroid patients, as you probably know, many of you, um, if you have thyroid, thyroid disease, are probably suffering from hair loss in some way. Now, uh, thyroid is kind of tricky in the sense that a lack of thyroid hormone, so hypothyroidism, if not treated correctly, can cause hair loss for sure. Um, however, also hypothyroidism itself sets up a, a situation in your body which increases the amount of iron that you are, well, let's just say it decreases the amount of iron that you can absorb. And iron and ferritin are two of the most, well, it's, ferritin is a way to assess for iron. So um, iron is one of the most important uh, nutrients when it comes to hair growth. So people with thyroid disease can often have multiple issues all playing together to result in um, the inability to grow hair. So uh, the short answer is, can Nature Thrive potentially help with hair growth? The answer is yes, maybe. Um, but even if you take Nature Throid and you still have low iron, it's not going to fix the problem, right? Um, and so you may actually need to take iron or at least look at your ferritin levels. Now this gets further complicated by the fact that some thyroid medications just cause hair loss as a negative side effect. So you have to be looking at all of these factors. I have a really comprehensive post that discusses all of the various ways that um, thyroid disease can cause hair loss and all the medications and how to know which to use, etc. on my website. I think it's called... Um, I don't actually know. I'll tell you right now. Uh, seven step guide to reverse thyroid hair loss plus, um, hair regrowth supplements. So you can look at this. This will go over sort of everything that I was just talking about. All right. So back to this. Um, this is a kind of a longer question, but we'll skip to the questions here. One, so Amy says one question about reverse T3. I'm looking at my labs and can't find reverse T3 on there. Would it be called something different? Um, she sees triiod or thyronine free serum, thyroxin free, thyroid peroxidase and thyroglobulin antibodies. Um, so reverse T3 is usually referred to um, as triiodothyronine, comma reverse or reverse triiodothyronine. So this triiodothyronine free is free T3. Um, thyroxin T4 free is free T4. So if you ever see me refer to free T3, that's this one right here, triiodothyronine free, and thyroxin T4 free is free T4. Um, so you did not have reverse T3 checked, at least not with what you're telling me here. Um, so you'll definitely want to go and actually get that one um, evaluated. Um, let's see, second question, I had a total thyroidectomy almost seven years ago, so I'm always technically considered hypo. Do these posts about people suffering from hypothyroidism also apply to someone who has a total thyroidectomy? That's a good question and one that I get pretty much all the time in every day in some way. So what, what people do is they read um, my blog and they read about hypothyroidism and they say, does this apply if you don't have a thyroid? And the answer is almost everything I write about applies to people with or without a thyroid. The reason is those who do not have a thyroid are still required to take thyroid medication. They have to use it. They will die if they don't take it. So you're, you, you are either producing thyroid hormone naturally by your own thyroid um, or you are taking it orally because you are on medication. But that doesn't change the fact that any medication that you take orally or you produce naturally has to be converted from T4 to T3. So a lot of the stuff that I talk about with thyroid conversion, um, thyroid medication, switching medications, it applies to people with Hashimoto's, it applies to people with hypothyroidism, and it applies to people who do not have a thyroid or to those um, who have had their thyroid ablated. So it's kind of all encompassing. Um, so I'd, hopefully, if anyone has that question, it'll be answered. But yes, the majority of the things that I'm talking about here apply in almost every scenario. Now, that's not universally true, but the majority of the, the, majority of the information um, does apply. Okay, I take 97.5 milligrams of Nature Thoid. This is from Eileen. Uh, and I still have symptoms. I read that having low cortisol, which mine is very low, decreases T3 from enter entering into the cells. It affects the receptors. Is this true? Um, 
So there is a relationship between uh, T3 and cortisol, um, but what you always have to put in the back of your head is, even though a study says that there's a relationship between the two, you have to ask yourself, does that relationship impact the way that a patient feels? So while there theoretically may be a connection between the two, um, does increasing that cortisol actually make you feel any better or have a clinical impact? Um, and the answer to that is less certain. So it is true that they impact one another, but the degree of which the impact occurs is not well known or not well established and probably varies from person to person. So keep that in the back of your head. Now, you go, you say originally that you're taking 97 and a half, but you still have hypo symptoms. So I would probably focus on that as opposed to focusing on your cortisol. So it doesn't make as much sense to look at the cortisol if you're being undertreated with your thyroid medication and hoping that fixing the cortisol will probably fix um, your symptoms. Now that may be true in some cases, but I would say the majority of people are probably undertreated. And so focusing on that thyroid medication is probably the smartest place to put your time and energy. Let's see. I've been on level thyroxine for 20 plus years. I've been feel, feeling lousy the past few months with fatigue, muscle joint, aches, hair loss, brain fog, etc. My doctor did labs and said my levels were in we're perfectly in range. However, my TPO is at 224. I'm so frustrated. Your thoughts, please. So this is from Marty. So yeah, this is, this is again, pretty standard among a lot of patients uh, and can be obviously very frustrating if you're in the situation. Um, first of all, if you have an elevated TPO, then your thyroid labs are certainly not normal. However, by the standard definition, they may be in range. So you have to, whenever you're taught, whenever you're looking at thyroid labs and you're trying to figure out if they're, if your labs are truly normal, um, Stop thinking about it in the sense of are they in range and think about it in the sense are they in the optimal range. And so this is sort of a, you have to sort of understand the way that labs, and by labs I mean like LabCorp and Quest, they produce the reference ranges that we use. So these reference ranges that they use are typically created based off of population studies um, where they look at a lot of people, usually the sample size of wherever they are located uh, generally, or, or and they take those people and they categorize them based off of statistics. And so they say 95% of the population will fall within the reference range that they produce. So it's a lot of people and a lot of variation. Now what you have to realize is that there are, it within, as they produce these ranges, these ranges don't always include healthy people. They can include older people, they can include younger people, obviously not the pediatric people, but if you're, let's say, 56, um, you could be compared to a 20-year-old woman. So that doesn't really make a lot of sense. Um, and so you have to always be putting this in the back or place this in the back of your mind. So instead of thinking about your test being perfectly in range, think about them um, as they relate to the optimal range. And I have a lot of information on my blog which talks about um, those ranges and what they actually look like. And so those aren't even a perfect way to assess whether or not you're in, wh whether, you're, whether or not your medication is optimal, um, but it is a good place to start. So. It, a lot of it depends on your symptoms. And here's the other thing. If you're taking thyroid medication to treat hypothyroidism, but you're still experiencing hypothyroid symptoms, then um, the chances are that you're being undertreated even if they show that they're normal, right? Because it, you have to be able to explain the cause of these symptoms. And the most likely, the smoking gun, is your thyroid. It's not something else. So that's just kind of the way that you should think about it. It's just a logical approach to it. Uh, oh, and then here, yeah. I have the thyroid lab tests. All right, I was, this is LB. I was on compounded thyroid when the doctor decided to pulse the dose 70% very quickly. I assume that means increase it. Um, of course, I had every symptom you mentioned above. I stopped immediately. Is it possible to keep the numbers and symptoms to check strictly by diet? I feel that I screwed up my thyroid. I was able to lower my antibodies significantly by being gluten, dairy, and dairy, sugar, and soy free. Also, what's the best way to wean off NDT? So I'm thinking what happened here is that this person took a high dose of NDT, so probably nature thyroid in this, ca in this case, and probably experienced hyperthyroid symptoms. Um, and she obviously didn't like that, or he, I'm not sure which. They didn't like that. And so they're trying to get off of the medication. And now they're asking, can you, can you do this just by diet and natural sort of um, remedies and things like that. And the answer is it depends. So it might be possible for you to get off your thyroid medication, um, but it depends on why you're on thyroid medication to begin with. So if you have, let's see, so you talk about your antibody. So if you have Hashimoto's, so this is a good one to talk about. If you have Hashimoto's, that means that generally you're, you're having some sort of, your body is attacking your own thyroid gland. Now, 
eventually, if this attacking is left unchecked for a significant period of time, this is usually on the order of years, um, 5, 10, 15, 20 years and such, if this occurs over that long period of time, it will eventually result in the destruction, um, which is an irreversible process to your thyroid gland, which means that you will be reliant upon thyroid medication indefinitely. So you end up with like this, this um, atrophied thyroid gland that just doesn't work anymore, even though it's still in your body. And that means if it's not producing thyroid hormone, you have to take thyroid hormone. Um, now, if you can stop that, this process from occurring, then you might be able to get off of the medication or at least lower your dose. So let's say that you've had Hashimoto's for 10 years um, and you know we don't know how much of your thyroid gland is destroyed during this time or how much is reversible or irreversible, but we can assume that maybe some fraction of it still functions. And so if you can completely reverse that through diet and exercise and lifestyle and supplements and things like this um, and s reduce your antibodies and reduce the attack on the gland, then yeah, maybe you can get off of that um, get off of that medication, but I, I don't have a, a nearly enough information to determine based off of that. I'm just speaking in general terms here. Um, in terms of weaning off NDT, I, I think that would depend on um, the factors I talked about previously, but also depends on um, what your dose is and um, a number of other factors. So I, I probably won't get into that right now. Let's see. Mm. All right. Sandra says, I am on Nature Throid for eight months after a disastrous trial of Levo that left me feeling worse with increased fatigue and hair loss. Gradually titrated up to 3.5 grains of Nature Throid and initially looked and felt great with nice weight loss and cessation of hair loss with free T3 at 6, but free T4 unchanged. TSH was suppressed. In recent months, I have been feeling symptomatic again with fatigue um, and hair loss, and her free T4, free T3 has dropped and she's not sure why. Reverse T3 has never been tested. The GP says she has never heard of this. Any ideas? Yeah, this happens all the time. So I think I think one of the things that people fail to consider or, or think about is the fact that the amount of thyroid that your body needs on any given day is not always the same. So just because a dose worked for you in the past, let's say you run 100 milligrams of levothyroxine, doesn't mean that in the next six months you, your body may need more than that. Now, the, the, here's where the problem comes in. Your body can produce uh, higher and lower amounts of thyroid on demand, assuming it works. So your body might be able to say, hey, well, today's a more stressful day or I have a greater need because I've been exercising more or I'm under more stress or I haven't been sleeping as much. So it says, here's more thyroid hormone to the body. Here, take this. And it uses it. And you never know the difference because, it, well, presumably if this happens if your thyroid is healthy. But what happens if it's not healthy? What happens if you're taking thyroid medication? So as this person suggested, their TSH was suppressed, so it basically it's non-existent, which means that her body is not able to produce any thyroid hormone, or at least a very small amount, on its own. So she is using the same amount of armor, or what did she say? Nature Throid. She's using the same amount of Nature Throid every single day, and that is a static amount of thyroid hormone in the body. It's not dynamic. It doesn't change. And so if something changes in her life, which is very likely to happen at some point in your life, you might deal with the, the death of a loved one, social stress, or relationship issues. I mean, you name it. Tons of things can occur. And that means that the body may have a higher demand. And so what happens? Well, you're, if you're not changing your dose, the, that demand is, and your body can't produce it because your TSH is suppressed, that demand is not going to be met and that can change your labs. So that, that essentially is what that can look like. Um, now, what you need to do is just reevaluate the labs and then kind of assess your treatment from there. But yes, that does happen. All right, well, that's a lot of comments there. Um, Lisa says, I get a constant headache when taking one grain or higher on NDT. I've only tried Armour and Nature Throid. It seems to be worse with Armour. Does this mean I cannot take NDT at all? Um, not necessarily. I think... You have to, what you'll probably have to do is you'll probably have to play around with the different types of thyroid medications. This is going to be difficult, I think, if you, depending on the doctor that you have and um, who's prescribing it. But I've had plenty of patients react with headaches, predominantly, I think, to the T3 component, maybe due to blood pressure changes or the force of contraction of the heart, something like that. Um, T3 lyothyronine tends to do this a lot. But I have seen the T3, or I suspect it's a T3 component within NDT that also causes this. So what I'd probably do, and it sounds like I think you've done this, is you switched around. So you were on nature. Well, you don't say. You just say, I was on a higher NDT 
Oh no, yeah, I've only tried armor and nature thread. So the next step would be to look into something like WP thyroid. So switch around and see if you can change up the NDT to see if the symptoms go away. And I would say a lot of the time that does occur. You can definitely play around with the dose um, and reduce a lot of these sort of um, negative symptoms that come. This could also be from some of the inactive fillers within the medication itself. So you might want to try something that's a, like a little bit cleaner like WP thyroid or tyrosine even with some T3 on the side. Something like that might work. Let's see. On Nature Thread for years, and this is Lynn. She says, on Nature Thread for years and works well, Hashimoto symptoms returning and doctor will not increase the dose because of my age. She is giving too much attention to TSH, says it's to suppress. Since when do we pay attention to T, I think she means TSH, afraid I will have heart problems. Your opinion, any studies I can refer to. So I would say um, this is probably goes back to what we were saying before. She's having symptoms and after being on a static dose and so she wants to increase the dose, which I think m might be reasonable depending on some of her labs. But then her doctor says no because her TSH is suppressed. Now I will say if you are over the age of, well, if you're postmenopausal and a woman, that's when you do start to get these risks for um, cardiac issues, cardiac enlargement, um, atrial fibrillation, and also potentially osteoporosis once your TSH gets uh, really suppressed. So um, you can look at the you can look at the studies. They do show that this is a possibility. But what you have to realize is you sort of have to weigh um, the the benefits with the with the cons. And so what I mean by that is not everybody who has a suppressed TSH will get osteoporosis or will develop atrial fibrillation. Now generally the logic would go well if there's a sufficient sufficiently high risk then we're not even going to try it. But if that risk is one percent that means you know you could treat a hundred people to suppress their TSH if they're over the age of uh, if they're postmenopausal, and only one of those people might have this negative consequence. So I, I feel like if you've tolerated the NDT, this is sort of my own personal opinion, I feel like if you tolerated the NDT, um, and you have for many years, um, and you have checked your, your bone density with DEXA scans, and you've checked the your cardiac function, and you haven't had a history of like um, heart failure, you haven't had any previous heart attacks or anything like that, so we know that your heart is healthy, then you're probably going to be okay to use that. But you have to realize that a doctor who is giving you NDT with a suppressed TSH is going to come under fire uh, if anything goes wrong. So they might be doing this more to protect themselves than to benefit you. It's just sort of the nature of the beast, but that does exist. So those are the things that I would I would look to. I have a whole blog post on that for sure as well. This one's a little long. Let's see, load some more here. Okay, Jan says, hi, Dr. Childs, I was on 162.5 milligrams of nature thread and found it was too high a dose. Can I go back to the 130 dose I used to be on to get the numbers normal or should I be gradual and start with the 146.25, which my new doctor just put me on? Thank you for your time. Um, a lot of this just depends on you and your body. So this question at the, at the heart of it is about how quickly and, and how aggressive can you be in altering the, your dose of thyroid medication. So I would say in general, you always wanna go low, um, start low and go slow. And so what that would mean, as you suggested, is that it's probably safer to go down um, in incremental dosage, but you don't necessarily have to. I think it depends on your body, it depends on you and a number of other factors. So I've done, I've done both. I've had patients that have to go so, you know, in, in such tiny doses that it's like, for other patients, they wouldn't even feel it. But this patient, these patients, if they're sensitive, they feel it. And so it just depends on you. I, I would say it's probably safer to do that incremental you know, reduction in dose. However, if you're still feeling hyperthyroid, I would say get it out of your system as soon as possible. So I think it depends on, I think it depends on those factors. Let's see, Kathy says, I started Nature Throid 32.5 milligrams three days ago. I stopped level thyroxine 100 milligrams at the time. Today I feel tired and some heart palpitations. Is this a good amount to start with? Do I need some time to adjust? My doctor said to take this for 28 days and to increase to twice that much after that. Yeah, so basically this question is about switching from T4 only to T4 or to NDT. We'll just say T4, T3 combination. Um, there, a lot of this again depends on the person, um, but you do want to generally start out lower. So you have to realize though, you went from taking 100, um, 100 mics of T4 and 32.5 milligrams of nature throid is what, um, 19 milligrams or 19 micrograms of T4. So you cut your dose dramatically down. Um, and yes, there's some T3. It's like 4.5 mics of T3 or whatever. Um, 
but you've cut your total dose from 100 down to this 32.5. Um, if you if you factor in the actual amount of T4 and the amount of T3, you've cut your dose down by a lot. And so, yeah, you're probably going to have some hypothyroid symptoms. Now, the heart palpitations are more likely related to you, your sensitivity to the T3. Um, and some of that may go away over time. So what I, what I think is probably happening in some individuals is, is that they're so starved for T3 that when they start to take it, their body just takes it up, gobbles it up, and utilizes it as quickly as it can. And some of that is going to go to the heart. And so the heart reacts differently than other tissues in your body. And so it can take it up quickly and increase the force of contraction and increase your blood pressure and your heart rate. And that can be, that can be felt by the patient as palpitations. So some of that will, may go away, but it might not either. So it, what you can do is if it's not going away after, I would say, one to two weeks or so, um, you can start at a lower dose if you want, or you can switch to something like sustained release T3 to see if that's any better. Um, so I'd probably... I mean, it, again, it depends on how intense the heart palpitations are. It depends on what your heart rate is, some factors like that. Um, but I would say you probably just give your body some time and you'll probably be okay um, in adjusting and going from there. But you don't really have the luxury of, you know, a, a lot of time because you dramatically dropped your dose. So even if it takes you, if it takes you, if you're there for a month, you're going to start feeling really crummy because your dose was dropped by by a lot. So I mean, probably 20, 20 to 25% of what it was normally. So you're going to feel bad if you, if you just drop your dose down to one fourth of whatever you're taking. So you have to be able to kind of titrate up. So if you can't do that, um, you might have to play around with some of the other medications that I talked about in order to do that. So there are actually a lot, a lot of questions here. I tried to do as many as I can just now. Um, hopefully that this was helpful for you guys. Um, if you have any questions, um, leave them below. Leave them on the blog, though, because I'll, I'll probably see those quicker than I do on, um, on any other um, avenue. So do leave them there. Um, probably not on this post, though, since there's so many. Um, but anyway, I hope you guys found this helpful. And again, if you want to go to this blog post to see some of these questions, um, this is the complete guide to using nature theory, dosing, plus weight loss, and more. And there's currently about 381 comments. So if you guys have any questions, let me know. Hopefully you guys found this helpful.